Morning. How are you all today? Great. Good. Not so good. Enjoying, enjoying the spring that is coming. Um, lots of mention about the thunderstorm this morning and then the sunshine coming in. It was just uh, really cool to, to stand under the porch and just, just watch, the, watch the thunder roll through. Well, hear it. You don't watch the thunder, but hear the thunder roll through and just the, the amazingness of, of being in a thunderstorm. I've always, I've always enjoyed, enjoyed thunderstorms. Um, I want to greet you this morning with the words that uh, Paul greeted the church at Galatians with, where he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What does it mean to be rescued? What does it mean for us to be free in our Christian lives? How do we, how do we interpret that? And, and I, I can't... I'm, I wonder if all of you would interpret it a little bit differently. Or you actually don't know the answer and you would just say, yeah, what he said or what she said. And, and you're just like, I don't know what that means. And, and we, we struggle with this idea of what life looks like as a Christian. And we look at other Christians and we even look at the world and we, we try to figure out what is it that I'm supposed to do? What's the will of God for my life? And we, we think that there's this specific path that God has for us. But what does it mean to be rescued? Uh, I, I just, it, it's just an interesting thought that we can see or we, we view God in light of being rescued. From what? That's, we'll, we'll get there. Um, before we dive in today, Kyle and Jillian, stand up. Kyle came and reminded me. There is the intent of marriage, so next Saturday these two are going to be married. If anybody has an issue with that, please come and see any of the ministerial, and I will, you're just standing there smiling. You're supposed to dance. You're like, celebrate. This is life, right? You guys are going to have the rest of your lives together. This is probably why they didn't ask me to do the wedding. <laughs> they, don't, they don't want me to just make things worse. You guys can go ahead and sit down. We'll try to, we'll try to remember, I'll try to remember, and you guys can remind me at the end of the service to let them walk out first. So, um, Psalm 22. Some time ago, I had a gentleman come up to me and he said, hey, Pastor Mike, I'd really like for you to preach on a series through Psalm 22. And I went, I'm like, are you aware of what you're asking me to do? And he stood there with a really goofy grin and he said, yes. <laughs> and I'm like, are you aware of how big of a task that is? And he stood there and he says, that's why I'm asking you. And um, so I, I don't recall the exact answer that I gave that gentleman. And um, something along the lines as to when the time is right. Whenever Father leads me to going through Psalm 22, um, I'll, I'll go through Psalms 22. So um, with that being said and us just getting through the identity series and just the feedback that I've been getting from the congregation and, and you guys just being excited about life. Not only life itself, but what it means to have life with Christ in you. And that he's not killed you as an emotional being. He's not said, no, you're not allowed to be who you know yourself to be. Becoming a Christian doesn't mean you have to transform the way you live. You actually get to have him live in and through you by the way he created you to be. Unique experiencing the life of God living in and through you the way he designed you to be because he likes you. It's one thing to know that Jesus loves you because I think most of us can say, yeah, I know, Jesus, Jesus loves me this song. Like we sing these songs in Sunday school, we do all these things. But I think it's another thing to say, God likes you. You ever think about that? I know he loves me, but does he like me? Like, man, that's weird. Have you ever went down that rabbit hole? But he does. He enjoys you. He delights in you. And, and going through Psalm 22 is going to be, it's going to be a whirlwind, I want to say. Um, we're going we're gonna to be looking into the reality of, of what is going, going on there. And 
Pastor Dave, last Sunday, uh, I had no idea what he was going to be talking about, and he ended his sermon with quoting Psalm 22, 1 and 2. And I, and I, I was sitting with Susie right there, and I was just like, <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to sharpen your elbows, right? But I'm like, look, what, look at what he's doing, right? This is so amazing. And, and also, Pastor Dave, in, in his sermon last Sunday, he, he talked about John, John chapter 5, verse 6, when he said, when Jesus, when Jesus saw him lying there and, he, and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to them, said to him, do you want to be healed? Well, it's kind of a silly question. He was laying by the pool of Bethesda. He was trying to get into the water so he could be healed. And Jesus comes up to him and says, do you want to be healed? And that question is being relayed to us. Maybe we're not lying by the pool of Bethesda, but maybe we lie in our own misery we lie in our own circumstances, and we just wish we could get out of the circumstances. We wish that God could make things better. And God comes along and says, do you want to be healed? And depending on, um, depending on your flesh, depending on whether you're positively programmed flesh or negatively programmed flesh, and how you interpret how you function in the Christian life, you might be thinking, no, I'm pretty good. I got things under control that's positively programmed flesh. And if you're negatively programmed flesh, you're probably thinking along the lines of, yeah, just take care of my circumstances. Because if my circumstances go away, I'll be in a better place. But I really think to the core, the core of the issue is Jesus is asking this man, do you want to be healed? Free from your identity in the circumstance. You see, that's where the Christian life really begins to count. Your identity, knowing who you are in God, outside of the circumstance that you're living in. And, and, and Psalm 22 is, is a powerful, powerful psalm. Um, to be brutally honest, it intimidates me of everything that is going on in there. So I want to, today, you'll see the title is, is, is a snapshot of Psalm 22. We're going to just do a really, really quick overview of the entire psalm. It's, it's, a, it's a little, it's not a lengthy psalm, but I call it a lengthy psalm. And um, so we're not going to read it every Sunday like I did when I did a series through Psalm 23. But we're going we're gonna to read it today, but then we're going to break it down and we're going to look at everything that is going on. But I want to encourage you to think outside the box. Because not only are we going to look into the Hebrew... And we're going to dive into what the Hebrew is saying. And not only are we going to, to look into going from the Hebrew, we're going to put it into a practical application of what does Psalm 22 practically, how does it practically apply to the Christian today? What does it mean for us living the Christian life today? And why I want you to, to think outside of the box is because I want to get past our traditional way of translating what is being written here. So I dare say we're going to challenge your concept of God. We're going to challenge of what's written in the Bible. And we're going to go beyond what King David wrote and experience. pulpit. I'm tied to the pulpit. It's okay. Probably can hear me talking better than behind the pulpit, but we'll see. Do you, do you have rope? If you don't bring rope, man, I'm probably going to walk. <laughs> Let's see. This nice new mic. Is this one like, you, there's a lot of feedback with this one. Do I always have to be very, very close to it? Oh boy, those guys are both shaking their heads. Are you sure you don't want to just bring me some batteries? <laughs> Sorry. Maybe they're thinking, Jesus, save Mike, right? Change him. <laughs> Make him <them> different. 
this whole Christian life thing, like just, sorry. So, we want you to think outside of the box. So, before we dive into um, breaking the psalm apart, I want to dive into a little bit of history or, or what the history of the psalm is. So, the history of Psalm 22 is they actually don't know when it was written. They know that it was King David, so we can put it in the life of King David, but they don't know when in King David's life that it was written. And what's, what's really neat is that this is also a messianic psalm. And, and someone might say, well, what does messianic mean? Well, messianic means uh, it's relating to the Messiah, his awaited deliverance of the Jews, or the new age of a peace expected to follow this of or relating to Jesus Christ or salvation, believing, believed to have been brought by him. So a messianic psalm is basically a psalm that talks about Jesus. It's, it's I'll say that simple, but not that simple. So what's neat about the messianic psalm is that we don't really have to worry about dating it. And, and as we begin to pick through and, and dive through what this psalm is talking about, we're going to see why I believe that it's actually not that important about when it was written. Um, and this is where I maybe want to break the boundaries. I want us to look at this as the hand of Jesus writing through David. So I, I'm not going to say that David didn't write the psalm. Please don't hear me saying that David didn't write the psalm, but I'm going to say David didn't write the psalm. Sure, the physical hand of David wrote the psalm. But this was God working through David. This is Jesus' um, personal experience of himself on the cross, which is Psalm 22. And this is where I'm, think, think, I'm saying I, we want to think outside of the box. We want to see what God has in store for us in this psalm. So, we're going to dive in. We're going to first read through the entire Psalm 22, and then we are going to break it to pieces in, in the reality of the sermons that I'm going to preach through this series. I'm not guaranteeing that each of these topics that we're going to go through today is going to be one sermon, but I will say that there will be a minimal of this many sermons. So Psalm 22, I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version. Uh, the quotes that I typically put up on the slides are usually the ESV, just because it's simple and that's what my program has, but I typically read out of the New American Standard Version, and if you want to follow along easier, you can follow along there, but I believe your pew Bibles are ESV or New King James. Whatever. Get your Bible, Bible apps out. Get your Bibles out. I'm not going to be doing like I did through my identity series where I put the scripture references on the screen. I will be putting the address but I want you folks to get used to using your Bibles or your Bible apps, highlighting, writing them, and just really being engaged in that area. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy. O oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate the lip. They wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Yet, you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. 
They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far off. You may help. Sorry, you, O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen, you answer me. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard him. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is yours, is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow down before him. Even he who cannot keep his soul alive, posterity will serve him. I will be told of, it will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, sorry, to a people who will be born that he has performed it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this day, the opportunity to to just come and and read Psalm 22 and read it in the the understanding and, and in just the amazement of everything that you have in store for us. And I just pray that as we continue to, to look to you for life, to look to you and, and see the emotions poured out by Jesus, to see the truth about you never left him, the, the conflict between the relationship between us, sin, and you, and just really, really diving in and understanding the, the great big picture of your glory. So I thank you and I, I confess my dependence upon you as we, we dive into this psalm and we dive into to looking beyond just traditionalism and really, really seeing what you have in store for us and that we may be able to apply what it means to have Christ as life as we live here in Southern Ontario in 2024. Again, I thank you so much and in your name we pray, amen. feels like there's something on my nose. <laughs> I want to knock this thing off. I'm not used to that thing. Okay, sorry. Rabbit trail. Um, so you're going to see, I'm just going to be going up on the screen, and you, you don't have to really follow on the screen, but now I'm going to break it down in these verses. Stephen found batteries. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and as Stephen is working on that, um, what we're going to do is, is, is we're going to go through, and we're going to go through how I'm breaking it apart. So you're going to see I got Psalm 22, 1 and 2, and we're going we're gonna to see, I got these little, in, in lowercase letters, I got these words that I'm saying what we're going to focus on in those two verses or three verses, and you'll, 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 see, the, you'll see the light of it as we go. Ta-da! There, now I don't have a booger hanging out of my nose now. Okay, so we're going to look first at Psalms 22, 1 through 2. This is Jesus, well, again, i got to be careful. I, you're going to learn, I fully believe that this is Jesus. And, and I'm going to, I'll say, defend that argument as we're going through today. So I'm going to just... 
we'll just read. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. The psalm starts off just ludicrous heavy. And, and this phrase of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We've talked a lot about emotions when we went through the identity series. And what did I teach you about emotions? That emotions, if you felt something, I'll never rob you of that feeling. I will never take that feeling away from you. But what I want you to do is interpret whether that feeling is a lie or whether it's truth. Is it you believing something about yourself and therefore it is a lie? Or is it something that you get to run to God and realize that this is a true emotion? And so when we look at Psalm 22, 1 through 2, and we look at feelings and emotions, Jesus is not afraid to express how he's feeling. We know very well that King David is not afraid to express how he's feeling. And with not knowing the time frame, and this is where a lot of theologians are going to guess, or they, they put a stab at, well, I think David wrote this at this time frame because of what he's saying. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But what's really interesting is we, we can see that Jesus quoted this in Matthew 27, 26, and in Mark 15, 34. I don't have time to go through those, but write those down if you'd like, but Matthew 27, 26, Jesus says, he's on the cross, he actually, it's actually recorded in Hebrew, and then it translated, translates it from Hebrew to English, and he, Jesus says, on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And a lot of people believe that traditional Christians will believe that that is the moment that sin fell on Jesus and God left Jesus. Because Jesus is saying, you have forsaken me. We're going to tear that to pieces. We're going we're gonna to dive in and we're going to see really, really what that means. So there's these two references that Jesus is talking about, Matthew 27, 26, and Mark 13, 15 to 34. One scripture that I do want to turn to is 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22, is, is amazing. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22 says this, For since by a man came death, and by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. Who are those two dudes? Adam and what? Adam and Jesus, right? Because, and then he's, well, let's just read verse 22. <laughs> For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Jesus knows right now at this moment on the cross, the world is about to be transformed. The way we live is about to be transformed. This is what Jesus is talking about in Psalm 22, 1 through 2. Um, yep. So Psalm 22, 3 through 5. Let's read that. Yet you are holy, O you who are throned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. So you'll see, I got truth, prophecy, and history. So Jesus goes from feeling the emotions to proclaiming the truth. In these next verses. And, and then I got prophecy in history because what is he talking about? He's talking about something that is about to happen. That's, that's the prophecy. But the neat thing in the history is Samuel, 2 Samuel 7, 15 through 16. So if you turn there, 2 Samuel 7, 15 through 16. So this is really neat. This is why this is a defending reason as to why I believe this is Jesus on the cross talking here. So 2 Samuel 7, 15 through 16 says this. But my loving kindness, that's a huge covenant word. As soon as I see that word in the Old Testament, red flag. But my loving kindness shall not be depart from him. As I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. So this is the prophet Nathan talking to King David. And he says to King David, 
He says, your throne, your kingdom will last forever. But he's actually talking about his son Solomon in this statement. So what's really neat in Psalm 22, in verses 3 through 5, David says, in you our fathers trusted. I'm just scratching my head, right? Because before, David, before King Saul, before David, were what? The, what's the book of Judges? And when you read through the book of Judges, you do not see a family lineage of these judges came from a specific family. Does that make sense? So when you read through the book of Judges, it says, okay, this dude from this father, he was now a judge, and he went and did these things. And this dude from this guy, he was this guy's father, and he was a judge, and he went and did these things. And you read through the book of Judges, and there's no clear lineage. Even though this statement here in 2 Samuel 7, 15 through 16, there's, there's no meal that's taken place. There's no sacrifice that's taken place. This is the inauguration of the Davidic covenant. I can't wait to get to this sermon because I, I, I'll run out of time when I get into this. Because the Davidic covenant is huge. Psalm 22 is actually talking about the Davidic covenant. Because when you read through 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, all it talks about is that, and this guy did right in the sight of the Lord. But it talks about what lineage? Specifically in Chronicles. Kings talks about Israel and, and how Israel was so wicked. But when you get into the book of Chronicles, it specifically talks about the kings of Judah. The kings of the lineage of David. And here in Psalm 22, David is writing, In you our fathers trusted. Well, those dudes weren't even alive yet. Because they're all David's descendants. So that's why I talk that it's prophecy and it's history. David was prophesying that the kings, his descendants, were going to trust in God. Well, Jesus knew this. David didn't. And this is why, again, I firmly believe that this is David, not David, this is Jesus talking here on the cross. And he is talking about his own lineage. Right? 22, 1 through 2, he's talking in emotions, and he is feeling like he is being left alone. And now he proclaims the truth, and he says, in you our fathers trusted. He is talking literally about the covenant that God made, not only the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and all of those covenants, and Jesus is now calling out about these covenants. Cool. Psalm 22. Whoops. I was going to go through all of that as well. We don't have time. Psalm 22, 6 through 8. It's coming. Don't you worry. So all of these little thingamajiggers, they're all going to be sermons. So don't, don't, we're, we're going to dive into it. I wanted to just really take a, a snapshot of what is going on. Oh, this is where it just gets even better. And I just don't have time to. But I am a worm. A reproach of men. Despised by people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag their head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. This is not emotions. Jesus is not, Jesus is not saying, I feel like a worm. He is actually prophesying what's about to happen. Pastor Corney went through this, I don't know, a year or two, year something-ish ago. He talked about the worm in Psalm 22. We will be also talking about what that worm represents in Psalm 22. And, not but, and there's this, there's this amazingness of what is going on. Oh, you know what? I think I fast-forwarded. I'm ahead of myself. Nope. I'm okay. So, there's this amazingness of what is going on, and these references were supposed to be part of, of what's going on. So Mark, Mark 15, 29, Mark 15, 31 through 32, Luke 18, 32 and 33, and Luke 23 through 25. I don't have time to look at those references. I really wanted to. The point that I want to make is 
if you know anything about the book of Luke, the book of Luke was written from Luke studying and seeking out the history of Jesus. So Luke is writing about what people remember about Jesus. And Luke records the amazing accuracy of what Jesus said on the cross. So when people in Jesus' day heard what Jesus said on the cross, they remembered it and told it to Luke. And Luke now records the very things that were written about in Psalm 22. It just, again, when we get into these sermons, it's just going to, it's going to erupt all of these truths of what's going on. So, so Psalm 22, 6 through 8, is prophecy, not emotions. Jesus is not saying, I feel like a worm. King David is not saying, I feel like a worm. He is actually prophesying about the truth that is happening at the cross. Psalm 22, 9 through 10. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Okay, so this again is truth, history, and prophecy. So the really, the really interesting aspect here is, this is, a, this is an easy question, but it seems like it's a weird question. All of us, when we were born, did we have to trust in our moms? It's not difficult, right? Yeah. All of us had to. Why does the psalmist make mention of this? Why is that new news for us? Why, why does it seem like, oh, yeah. I didn't know David had a mother and had to trust in her. Like, why is it there? How many gods had to trust in an earthly woman to be their provider? Only one. Jesus. That's why I say this is truth, history, and prophecy. Jesus is now talking about realizing prophecy is Psalm 22, Jesus hasn't died on the cross yet. Psalm 22, Jesus hasn't been born yet. He is talking about the prophecy and the reality of this, and now it's history today. And we get to put all these pieces together. So this is, this. Uh, I think all of them are going to be just amazing sermons, but this is just another picture as to what is going on. And, and why I believe this is Jesus talking. Jesus had to trust upon his mother. Psalm 22, 11 through 13 says, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and roaring lion. So now, now we're back to feelings, even feelings of anxiety, and we're also talking prophecy. So this is where I believe Jesus is, Jesus is on the cross, and he is actually describing what he sees. And, and when you, you're like, oh, was there a bunch of bulls running around? Like, what do you mean by bulls of Bashan? We will get into that, and it is amazing, amazing what, what we see going on here. So Jesus is talking about feelings, Feelings of anxiety, and then he's also talking about prophecy. He's talking about not only the physically what he sees before him, but he's also talking about the spiritual battle that is being represented as to what's going on at the cross. So Psalm 22, 14 through 18 says this, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength, is, my strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Again, I believe Jesus here on the cross is seeing what is going on. 
He is literally talking here in Psalm 22, which is a thousand years prior to Jesus dying on the cross. He is literally describing the scene at the cross. And we have, we have scriptures that back that up. If you go to John 19, 24, it talks that they cast lots for Jesus' garments. And we will be getting into the fact, the difference between, so the, the, the words, the terminology that Jesus uses here in Psalm, he begins to describe the difference between the Romans and the Jews. When he's referring to, the, when he uses this word dogs, he's referring to the Romans. He's refer, referring to the world. Not only are the Jews persecuting me, but God, you're giving the world to kill me. You're, you've given me over to the world to kill me. And another thing that's really interesting is King David knew nothing of crucifixion. There was no such form of punishment as piercing people's hands and feet in King David's day. But yet, they have pierced my hands and pierced my feet. So again, this is a picture of Jesus really, really sharing what is going on at the cross. So prophecy... And future history is, is where we are going to be looking into that. Psalm 22, 19 through 21 says this. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen. You answer me. So, Deliverance. We finally got to the point of deliverance. Jesus is now looking and reflecting on what is surrounding him. And he's saying, God, to don't be far away. But uh, in verse 22, we, we're not there yet. But he assures, we are assured that God has saved him and that there is deliverance. And this is, this is where I was leaning a little heavy on at the beginning of the sermon, are we willing to be healed? Do you want to be healed? And, and Jesus is on the cross and he is, he is waiting till the last minute and he is crying, well, he cried out to God earlier, but are we willing to go to God for healing? And what does that, what, what do we need healed? What needs healing? Well, maybe you're thinking, well, we died on the cross with Jesus. So our spirit doesn't need healing, and I agree, because you are a new creation in Christ. What needs healing? What do we need to stop being dependent upon? Our flesh. The old way of living, the understanding of, of what we've done. Our independence of God is what needs healing. So Psalm 22 22 through 24 says this, I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in the awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. For he is not despised, nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to help, when he cried to him for help, he heard him. Now we see the psalm take a turn. And, and many people, many, many theologians believe that from this point on, the psalm is making, he is talking about deliverance, but he's, he's drawing on the same conclusion, and, and, I don't, and I don't agree. And we're going to pick that apart as we go through. Um, it talks about Hebrews 12, verse 2. Again, we don't have time to dive into Hebrews 12, verse 2, but there's a reference to Hebrews 12, verse 2 in this portion of, of the psalm. So, in a nutshell, the, the desire that we have to live a works-based Christianity proves to be futile. This is what Jesus is saying here. It is God that delivers us. It is Jesus in us that lives the Christian life through us. And and the, the weakness or the, um, the strength of us living the Christian lives by ourselves is, is actually hopeless. 
And so many of us Christians want help. We want to know how to live the Christian life better. And that's why churches that preach a very works-based faith system, and if we tell you, if we tell you how to dress, what to eat, what not to eat, what to drive, what not to drive, where to work, what not to do, and we give you all of these regulations that make you a good Christian, well, then you can go achieve it. And then instead of giving glory to God, you can say, I did everything the pastors told me to do. And sometimes, uh, I want to say a lot of times, people go, but I still feel depressed. I still feel like I'm missing something. And that's where, we, that's where the question comes in. Do you want to be healed? It's not about this um, figuring out how to live the Christian life. It's actually about letting God deliver us. Psalm 22, 25. I don't know why I say Psalm 22 every time. 25 through 26. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. So this is mission accomplished. Jesus has died on the cross. The new covenant has come in. And this is basically saying that God's work, God's plan of Jesus going to the cross is accomplished. So Psalm 22, 27 through 28 says this, All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. This one is, this one will actually really, really good. I've got a very short little snippet for, for this one today. But this one is talking about God's sovereignty. There is no God like Yahweh. And I, and I use Yahweh, and we're going to get into that, into that sermon just a little bit. But I use Yahweh for, for a very specific reason. But we are talking about the sovereignty and the kingship of Yahweh. And that's what's going on here in Psalm 22, 27 through 28. And then we have the finishing 29 through 31. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him. Even he who cannot keep his soul alive. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. That he has performed it. Celebration. The extent of God's work. This sermon is a long time in the making, but when I get thinking about this portion of the psalm, I got crazy ideas of what we can do for this celebration. Because we need to celebrate. And we talk about worship, and we talk about what it means to worship an almighty God. But how do we actually celebrate it? And that's what these verses are talking about, and that's what, that's what that sermon is going to, be, going to be going through. So, Psalm 22 is an amazing song. I thoroughly believe that this is Jesus' life viewing from being nailed on the cross. And as we're going to explore that, we're going to explore into the Hebrew, and we're going to explore the reality of, of what is happening. And I, I just pray that we can experience this together. Those of you who love to come to church and take notes, you're, pro you're probably going to really like this series. Those of you who even just love to come to church and are just, are, are just say, warriors for getting excited about church on a Sunday morning, you're going to love this too because we're just going to explore Psalm 22, the Bible, in ways that aren't the way we normally do it. And bringing in all of these avenues and these aspects about the history of God, what we already know about God in the New Covenant, and how Jesus is talking about New Covenant stuff a thousand years before it even happens. The reality of the spiritual warfare that is going on. The terminology of the bulls of Bashan. Why does he talk about a lion? Why does he talk about being rescued from the horns of an ox? All of these realities are just pictures of the amazing celebration we get to celebrate as a church of the new covenant. So, it's going to be a lot of fun. I am out of time today. 
And I, I wanted to just dive through that snapshot to really give you guys an idea of what we're going to be going through when we go through Psalm 22. I encourage you just to, to get involved. I encourage you to reach out to me. I, I just got a, I got a feeling, I don't know that this is going to happen, but there might be things said and you're just like, huh? Where do you get that idea from? Send me an email. Let's talk. Let's chat. Let's really, really digest this together. God's grace, living in God's grace, is something that will never make us tired. And when you think about the nation of Israel and how they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years and their sandals never wore out, that's, that's a long time for a pair of arachas to hold up. <laughs> and it's just, wow, this is God's grace. How many of us get tired of living the Christian life? I dare say at some point in time of our lives, all of us have. What is that an example of? It is us living the Christian life out of our own effort. Not through the grace of God. You will work. You will run. And you will not grow weary. Because you will be living through His strength, His life, and His love as opposed to you trying to find a way to conjure up what it means to be a Christian. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Kind of a shotgun style sermon today, just plowing through a pile of texts. It's outside of my normal and it actually feels really uncomfortable. And I just pray that we can just really, really want to learn. See what you are saying. And not only see what you are saying, but experience what you are experiencing. Because when you wrote Psalm 22, you weren't on the cross, but yet we believe you were. You were not bound by time. So this, this amazing truth that we talk about that we died on the cross with you. Do we feel and experience Psalm 22 in our spirits? Or do we become complacent in our bodies and in our souls and think, well, that really never happened to me? This Jesus and me dying on the cross is sure, I can't argue the pastors about that theology, but I really don't know what it feels like. I pray that we can begin to experience the Christian life, feel these truths, and own them. They might bring many tears. It might bring a lot of confusion. It might even bring anger and frustration. But I pray that we own it. And we experience what it means to live Psalm 22 today. And live in the deliverance of an almighty God. The God of Israel. The Father of all nations. Yahweh. Living in and through His people. I'm blown away. And I just pray that we can experience this as a church together. And that we don't limit it. We don't limit it to this body. That we learn to be the church to one another. And we do the dangerous thing of being church to the people outside this building. You living in and through us, Father. You truly are an amazing God. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Take a moment in silence. Thank you, Father for listening to our prayers.